always have great times in the brewery, like, you know, we contributors. I feel we contributors. Like, we made it what it was, eh? You know, we made what it was. the working people, the working people. Yeah. I mean, we had a good living. We educated our kids better than the opportunities that we had. True, you know, thanks to being Mission Coffee. Isn't that right, Margaret? Yeah. We had a great quantity of life. Very talented people there. Quite a friendly, caring atmosphere. Yeah. I mean, you go in the morning and you'd um, look at in at the lab. I'd usually then walk across to the production plants, and I'd go and take a bottle of whatever product was there, taste it, you know, just sip, taste it, see if it's okay. The hops are um, weighed out for addition to a brew and uh, tasting the hops but it, it really means just rubbing them together and sniffing them because you, you don't taste hops. You never taste anything for a week afterwards. <laughs> They're so bitter. I go to the, the filler and make sure that the, the bottles were being filled properly. Go into the kegging plant, sample the product, talk to the men on the line, talk to the supervisors and uh, at Half past twelve, there'd be a tasting session in the small bar. All the products from the previous day's production and all the beers that are ready for the next day's production would be tasted by a panel. And uh, we'd score the beers, give it a number, and then we'd discuss it. If anybody was happy with sign off the sheet, those were beers that were cleared for production, depending on analysis then, of course. I mean, the, the lab would analyse everything they could possibly analyse in the product. Well, I mean, Beamish just needed products at the time other than Stout, which was the only product we had, really. And uh, Bass was launched sometime in the, the late 60s, early 70s. It was an ale, an English ale, and it took off, like, oh, hugely, initially in Ireland. We produced a, a, an ale ourselves in the, the mid-60s called Celebration and uh, that was very successful for a short period of time. <laughs> very light beer to drink but it had a, a higher alcohol content than you'd expect and uh, I think it affected a lot of people <laughs> adversely. <laughs> it was so easy to drink but I didn't realise that I suddenly became dizzy. <laughs> There were going to be commemorations of the 1916 Rising, so they uh, mark its history by uh, producing this beer called Celebration. <laughs> there was a version of Beamish called Tower Stout put out. It was uh, a little cheaper, and uh, that that would be been around the same time in the between. 1966 and 1970-ish, you know. Yeah, there was lots of romances there, all right. Yeah. Carmen Ryan uh, in the Edmund married um, Kevin, uh, he was a chemist. At once, Andrew O'Neill married, married, met his wife in there. She was a Tem, and uh, they're very happily married. Eileen was a switchboard operator, but she trained me into the switchboard, and um, we became the best of friends. She really took me under, under her wing, wing, you yeah. know what I mean? And I was up to her flat and she was young when she died. She was she? very young, but she was lovely. My predecessor, uh, he was a, he used to play the guitar, and he said they formed a group called the Mashton Tree. Uh, next to a person joined it afterwards, and they had to call it the Mashton Four, <laughs> which was funny because there was a Mashton called Mashton Four in the brewery. Of course, there was an awful lot of drinking. 
along with us, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very wet. Yeah. I'd have gone to their weddings, so then their kids, Chris and I, we went up to see them in the hospital. As yeah. they grew up, when they went to school, we'd give presents for the first day in school, you know, these yeah. things. So we all knew one another as family. Yeah. Richard Beamish, the, um, the chairman of the company before the Canadians took over. As I say, became an non executive director and eventually retired, you know, but used to walk in and out, you know, at various things. Because of his eminence and his connection with people, he was often asked to officiate at functions. You'd often see him down at the trilly races, chatting up the punters. The Tight Houses was a pub, pub which was tied to the brewery in some way. Either the brewery owned it, or they owned the lease, or some other reason that the company the pub owed them money and couldn't pay it. <laughs> And uh, they were obliged then to only sell um, the firm's products. Beamish's had, to my recollection, somewhere between 30 and, and 50 tight, tight houses, mostly in Cork and a few surrounding areas. And um, of course, we had to manage and maintain them. Well, that was a, a big cost. The company, but uh, on the other side, at the cost, then you had an ex ex exclusive sale of your products, which you know was mainly stout at the time, anyway. Um, the whole thing collapsed eventually because Guinness was so powerful in the country that a lot of these tight houses had to have Guinness to survive. Still there, but I'd love to be able to go over and put my arms around it and hold it. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. 